Hello everyone. Our next presentation is on scaling analytics and AI across millions of connected vehicles, people plus processes plus tech. Please welcome from Geotab, Mike Branch. Hi there folks. Uh, pleasure to uh, be here this morning. Um, I'm going to just share my screen here and we'll get started. Hold on a sec. Here we go. Wonderful. So like I said, a pleasure to be here. Um, I wish it could be in person, of course, as I'm sure we all do at, at this point in time. Um, but uh, having said that, you know, I, I think I, I always like to start things off uh, a little bit personal, talk a little bit about um, uh, just where I come from as well, too, because without being able to see everybody and meet everybody in person, uh, this is the next best thing. Um, so very quickly, um, so I graduated uh, University of Toronto Computer Engineering uh, way back in 2003. Um, I uh, shortly thereafter I started my own software company. Was running that for about 13 years. Did a lot of work in the healthcare space. Um, and toward the end of uh, that, uh, we started developing some data visualization software with a huge geospatial context uh, called Maps BI. And that's when we were uh, acquired by GeoTab a couple years after that. Uh, so I ended up uh, being a partner of Geotabs for a couple of years. And then in 2016, I started my uh, my career path at, at Geotab. So that was just over five years ago. Um, and uh, the, the team has grown significantly. So since I've started, we, we grew that uh, you know data and analytics team from about five in 2016 to over 90. Uh, the company has experienced uh, some tremendous growth over the last few years. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, during my time at, at Geotab, I actually went back and did my master's in management of artificial intelligence and at, uh, at Queens, I was in the inaugural year of that and actually hired a few people from that program back into Geotab as well too. Um, uh, in terms of personal life, you know, I, I've got a family uh, out here in Oakville. Uh, I've got three kids, all under five. You can see them in the laundry hamper there. It's uh, been a crazy time during COVID here as it has been for everyone. Um, our little girl, Sydney, she was born March 15th. So just the uh, the day before everything really went into uh, to lockdown, March 15th of 2020. Um, prior to COVID, you know, I'd, I'd uh, love to go skiing, uh, check out some theater, travel. Um, and during COVID, I've done a lot of home improvement. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of context um, uh, about me and kind of where I hail from. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to get in touch with me, I have my LinkedIn um, profile you can kind of check out. I've shared that at the end of the presentation. So uh, the agenda for this morning, I'm going to go through a little bit about uh, Geotab, first of all, um, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're doing and, and where we come from. Two, uh, talk a little bit about AI, just a quick primer in the state of AI right now in 2021, where we're at. And then talk about some uh, scaling uh, challenges for AI and how we do it at Geotab uh, with people, uh, process and technology. Um, so that's what we're going to go through today. So quickly, let's start with uh, a little bit about Geotab. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Geotab uh, has been around for about 20 years. Uh, we're uh, headquartered here uh, in Canada, just outside of Toronto in Oakville. Uh, we've got um, a, a hugely growing ecosystem uh, across, the, uh, across the globe. When I started uh, with Geotab, I think we were just under 200 employees. This was in 2016. Now, I think as of just a couple of days ago, we cracked the 2000 mark. Uh, so even that number there is a little bit outdated, 1800 employees. Um, and we were monitoring at that point in time, about 400,000 vehicles five years ago, and now we're uh, cracking almost two and a half million vehicles. Uh, so we work with some of the uh, largest fleets uh, in the world, uh, fleets like uh, PepsiCo and, and UPS, but also some very small fleets. We have over 50,000 customers ranging in fleet size of one all the way to through to over 100,000 in all sorts of types of vehicles. You can imagine any business that would operate a fleet of vehicles, whether that be a rental car agency, construction uh, 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 folks, uh, public sector, you name it, they would be a customer or potential customer of, of Geotab. And the interesting thing about Geotab, we don't go direct to market, we go through a network of partners. Uh, so we really believe in building that ecosystem uh, approach whereby um, uh, you know, it's, it's our partners building some really interesting things on top of the platform, uh, the Geotab platform. Uh, typically, uh, people use our platform for a number of reasons, safety, productivity. You know, we've got a little device plugs into the OBD port of vehicles. We're also collecting data directly from OEMs 
uh, like Ford, like GM, um, and uh, we're using that data to better enrich um, uh, our, our customers' experience. So providing uh, safety reports so that people can look at, you know, how safe their vehicles are on the road, predictive maintenance, you name it, a, really, a lot of really rich insights, which I'll get into. Um, we are, you know, financially strong company, private company, and, and we were actually listed on the uh, Canadian Norwell list uh, uh, last year as well, too. So um, a lot of really good and interesting things happening. And sometimes we float, uh, float under the radar a little bit because we go to market through our network of, of partners. Um, this map that I'm showing you here is actually not a map that was drawn from OpenStreetMaps or Google Maps or, or here or anything. This is one day's worth of driving of um, vehicles equipped with a, a GeoTab device. And this was uh, from probably about two years ago. So you would imagine that the network is a little bit more dense even uh, now as we speak. So uh, we're processing data from, again, almost two and a half million vehicles, um, over 50 billion data points collected every single day. And that isn't just GPS. We're connected to the rich engine diagnostic data in a vehicle. Um, you can see our little Go device there that plugs into the vehicle. Sure, capture anything with speed, acceleration, location data, um, uh, engine diagnostics. So whether your windshield wiper is activated or not, the ambient air temperature outside. Um, and what's more, we're really that connected device for the commercial uh, fleet, right? So you can plug in uh, temperature sensors if you're monitoring uh, food or pharmaceuticals uh, uh, for, from a cold chain. Uh, supply perspective, uh, you can uh, plug it into a snowplow controller so we can look at, you know, the plow up, plow down status. We've got many, many departments of transportation that are using us for um, uh, tracking how they're spreading salt and sand throughout um, the winter months to make sure that they're adhering to, uh, to best practices across the board. So it really is that kind of one device that not only hooks up data from your vehicle, but other third party sensors as well, too. And our marketplace of partners really builds uh, onto this as well too, which is uh, kind of neat. So you can imagine the amount of data that comes in just as a result of some of uh, these uh, added bonuses. Uh, I welcome anybody uh, to the offices. Whenever we get back to uh, Norm, please uh, come and, and, and say hi. Uh, we're, uh, so the main office is in Oakland. If you were able to come, this is the kind of, you know, uh, dashboards that you would see. We've got, you know, a, a pretty big facility that is equipped with these giant dashboards. We truly believe in management by measurement. Um, we've got world-class research and development uh, happening here at, uh, at Geotab. And uh, these screens are kind of permeated throughout the entire uh, office and organization so that people can keep on track of, you know, uh, wh what we're doing. Uh, everything from subscriber counts uh, through to uh, any device issues, um, uh, through to fun marketing stats like how many times, uh, you know, we've uh, made trips uh, to the sun and back based on the cumulative amount of driving from Geotab vehicles. So, a lot of really, uh, really cool stuff. We do believe uh, wholeheartedly in, in management by measurement. So you will see this across the board. And again, I welcome anybody to the offices uh, when we when we get uh, back to norm. So a few interesting kind of data and AI applications that we are are running through right now. Uh, I mentioned you know predictive maintenance being one. One of the things that you know that we're capturing from vehicles, we're capturing everything from like I said, ambient air temperature through to you know cranking voltage. Um, the things that are really important for a lot of our fleet customers are being able to capture, you know, uh, to make sure that their vehicles are up and running as, as much as possible from a productivity perspective, from an operations perspective to meet their customers service level agreements. It's important that they're up and running um, uh, all the time, especially as you can imagine and nowadays uh, with the, the demand for last mile delivery and, and, and this kind of thing and demands that customers have uh, on uh, some of our customers, which would be things like UPS and um, Purelator and this kind of thing. So um, keeping the vehicles on the road is so important. Um, and so predictive maintenance becomes that much more important. So if a you know a vehicle is down on the side of the road because its battery has failed, well, guess what? The cost of replacing the battery is, is quite cheap actually, uh, but it's that downtime which costs them a significant amount of money. Um, so what we've developed and uh, continue to develop both ourselves at Geotab and through our partner ecosystem is a number of predictive maintenance uh, types of applications. So I can tell you now a few weeks in advance that on these vehicles, you're 
battery is going to fail. And I look at, I do that through machine learning algorithms that we've put in place uh, that look at the cranking voltage trends, uh, features that we've developed there, all the way through to uh, the, uh, the, the region of operation, uh, the temperature, and this really helps us uh, help our customers. We've also just launched uh, last week, actually, a new line of business called Geotab Intelligent Transportation Systems. Um, and, and this is really focused around a, a few different things. At aggregate and privacy compliant, we can, uh, we're helping municipalities uh, uncover things like freight bottlenecking from ports all the way through to the city, understanding um, you know, the impact of last mile delivery within cities, um, uh, looking at uh, very specific corridors within cities um, uh, from a traffic planning perspective and understanding is there opportunity for things like freight signal priority uh, within your city. So Geotap Intelligent Transformation Transportation Systems is something that I'm certainly very excited about, um, leverages a lot of this data uh, at scale uh, to derive some, some very interesting insights. We also make a, a lot of uh, vehicle recommendations and a vehicle recommendation um, can come in a number of different forms. It could come in the form of uh, better fuel economy. Are you in the right vehicle for your fit? Um, would it be suitable for you to have a motor a pool of vehicles? Uh, which vehicles in your fleet are best suited to be replaced with electric vehicles based on how they're driving? We've done a ton of research and work on this and that little kind of um, animated GIF that you see below there what that's showing is one of our models and each dot in that model represents a single vehicle. And I think in that specific model, there are about 100,000 vehicles there. And the proximity of one vehicle to another tells us how closely related they are from a movement pattern perspective. So that if I'm telling you uh, how uh, you can, uh, which vehicles are better for, for you from a fuel economy perspective, I can do it based on vehicles that are actually driving very similarly to you. So I can tell you, is it better to drive a Chevy Silverado or, for, or a Ford F-150 in the Rocky Mountains for service and delivery type work? So uh, really cool stuff and, and models that we've created on vehicle recommendations. And, and then another uh, application, I think specifically in light of COVID and what's happening, we've been able to kind of model um, activity, economic activity in industry by looking at the vehicle movement patterns in industries and seeing which are recovering more to the norm. We actually launched a dashboard, you know, near the beginning of, of COVID, much in a similar way to how Johns Hopkins was mo monitoring COVID cases throughout uh, the world. We were monitoring um, uh, the impact to commercial uh, freight movement and, act and activity uh, in the commercial vehicle sector based on uh, what we were, the trends that we were seeing. Um, so some really interesting stuff there as well too. Um, so let's kind of peel back just quickly uh, to talk a little bit about AI, uh, quick primer and, and where we're at right now really in 2021, because it's advanced quite a bit, still a lot of room to, to grow, but uh, there's been some significant advancements specifically in the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm not gonna go too deep here, but just to provide a quick overview before I jump into a few other things. So starting very, very, very basic, what is AI, right? So AI is the ability, simply the, the ability of a computer program to learn and to think. And the goal of AI is, is really single fold. It's to make predictions. Um, and when you boil it down, you know, a prediction is just simply using information that uh, you do have right now to generate information that you don't have. And things like what's the price of a stock gonna be tomorrow? Uh, will this autonomous vehicle um, you know, what will be its trajectory into this intersection? Um, does this person have cancer? So there's, um, it's simply to, to, to make these prediction is the goal of AI. And what's really interesting with regards to um, making these predictions, um, it's become a heck of a lot easier to do that because the cost of making a prediction has drastically decreased. And you look at, you know, of when AI was really first coined in like the 1950s all the way through to today uh, with the advent of everything from our um, uh, from GPUs to the internet and this kind of thing it's the cost of decrease uh, of, of making these predictions has significantly decreased and when this happens three things occur we start using more of it we use it for derivative works and the cost of things related to it are impacted as well too and that's when we get disruption ensuing right so um, this was back in, I think it was 2013, when Amazon had a, a patent for anticipatory um, shipping. So they got so good at predicting when you would need something that they would uh, ship it to you before uh, you, you knew you, you really needed it. And so it 
change that whole mentality from shopping to shipping to ship to shop, right? And it's this, that's when we start getting a lot of disruption. Um, and again, the relationship between IoT, big data, and AI, again, quick primer here, I'm sure a lot of this will be repeat, just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, IoT is, um, it's, it's the Internet of Things, Geotab's the Go device itself um, is an IoT device, right? So we sense data from the world around us, uh, whether that be, you know, acceleration profiles uh, or uh, rich engine diagnostic data. And then that data gets saved to a big data ecosystem. And, and the goal of big data is really to remember all of this data and provide mechanisms for us to access that data as, as quickly as possible. And then that data is used to train artificial intelligence uh, models and machine learning models. Uh, it can be supervised, unsupervised. You could uh, uh, use deep learning. Um, there's so many different uh, types of models and so many advances there. But the goal of AI then is to make a decision and to take, take action, make these predictions, right? So that's kind of the relationship again as um, uh, it relates to IoT, big data, and AI. And, and the interesting thing I think over the last few years is that we started to see um, uh, a huge amount of pickup in AI. And uh, this comes from a, a report that McKinsey did back in, in 2020, looking at the spend of AI globally. And we can see it increasing quite significantly, but it's not only the spend that's increasing with you know estimated $110 billion in 24, 2024 being spent, but it's the increase in the adoption and the impact that this is uh, starting to have on, on businesses. And it's uh, at, what we're seeing is that AI is being uh, more democratized across the board. A lot of the cloud vendors like AWS and Google and Microsoft are making it easier for people to leverage and use AI so that you don't have this a uh, huge spend in research and development, uh, which has happened in the past and, you know, still continues to happen um, in certain areas. And the top three sectors where people are leveraging, no surprise, you know, high tech, telecom, but also automotive uh, and assembly. And the top three business functions, if you're looking at what's happening with AI, is in product and service development, service operations and, and marketing and sales. And, and so where a lot of folks have had really good success in leveraging AI is to better improve the operations of uh, their their own suite of products. And, you know, that's a lot of where Amazon sees its, um, um, its, its use of AI is improving that customer experience, right? How do I make sure that, you know, my servers are always, op how can I predict the demand for need on my technical infrastructure? Um, so anything that can help them uh, pr provide that top level uh, customer experience. AI is being spent there and it's doing quite well. And there are a number of things happening from an AI perspective where you have these, these top performers that are just outpacing the rest. And, you know, McKinsey did a really interesting analysis looking at what is it that makes these top performers really outpace the rest of, because of, if we're going to scale AI, we're going to scale analytics, we need to make sure that uh, you know, we're, we're doing things that align ourselves to those top performers and in high performers, two and a half, almost two and a half at times, uh, are they more likely to consider their C-suite of leaders effective? They boil it down into a, a few different categories in terms of what makes them, what separates them from the rest. And one is strategy, of course, I think that kind of goes without saying, to have your management, uh, your senior management fully aligned to the AI strategy for the business is crucial. And that isn't happening across the board, but in these top performers, we're seeing that quite a bit. Talent and leadership, the amount of times I've seen, you know, people say, okay, we'll just, you know, throw a couple of data scientists uh, at, at a specific problem. Well, that's not gonna get you what you need. It's a full team that needs to come together. You let, need to look at these AI projects more deeply than just throwing a data scientist. There's so many skill sets, everything from, um, you know, data engineers to machine learning engineers to product management, they all need to come together. And, um, and having, a, you know, management that really understands that is, is crucial. Your ways of working as well. You got to understand that not every AI project is going to be a success. There are going to be some risks that you need to take, um, especially as you're trying to scale AI out there. There's a number of risks that you can have, you know, models that work exceptionally well um, uh, on lower volumes of data. But as you start to scale this and you need uh, the performance uh, to be there, it's going to take some, some active research and development. The models and technology uh, that uh, that you have, 
Uh, so, uh, you know, having the ability to track your model performance, how well is it actually doing over time uh, is, is crucial. Paying attention to data, data quality, I can't underscore this enough. And if you get nothing out of this presentation, then what it takes to really scale uh, analytics and AI initiatives is, a high, is an obsession with data quality. Um, that would be the number one thing I would hope you would take out of this presentation. Obsess over data quality because if you don't have good data quality, guess what? You're not going to have good analytics. You're not going to have good AI. And that is so crucial um, to, to everything that we do. And then uh, uh, adoption. Again, it's um, you know a, a mechanism to track a series of KPIs that drive these, uh, these AI initiatives. So I think so, a really interesting study. If you're interested, have a peek at uh, McKinsey's State of AI report for, for 2020. And as a result of COVID, um, we're seeing a huge increase in adoption of uh, AI with all the high performers, 61% of them said they're increasing their investment, uh, others 25%, and specifically in these sectors. So healthcare, automotive, financial services. So uh, uh, we're, we're seeing quite a shift over the last few years in specific in the adoption of AI. I think it's uh, really exciting, some, some good things happening across the board. Uh, in general, but that's not without its challenges. As we look at scaling AI, we look at doing this, um, even here at Geotab, as I mentioned, we've got, you know, two and a half million vehicles serving up, uh, you know, uh, insights and um, uh, and collecting so much data on, um, you know, a, a minute by minute basis. It's not without all of its challenges. So I thought I'd speak about some of the challenges, you know, certainly that we've faced and how we surmounted them um, in some cases and working on in other cases. So, I mean, if you look at an artificial uh, project in AI, what, what makes it challenging, right? If you look at a traditional software development project, there are obviously certain challenges and we've, uh, you know, figured out ways to navigate around these challenges with uh, different processes like agile. And we started off with waterfall and there's different techniques that you can do to make sure that your projects are successful. But AI adds a whole other element to it. Uh, as well. And again, it comes back to that good quality data, right? So data governance at its core is so important. Um, AI relies on a consistent stream of data, high quality coming in. If you don't have that, your models will end up learning in uh, ways that you can't imagine. Your data scientists won't have a good appreciation for what the data actually means. So having a good layer of data governance that underpins everything that you're doing is crucial. And I will say that setting something up like this is in itself a, uh, a challenge uh, because your data isn't staying stagnant. It's constantly changing. You're, uh, you're going to be pulling in data from other systems and having a good way of operationalizing that is, is crucial. Um, there's a, there can be a significant time spent in exploration. So you, you have to understand where your low risk AI projects are and where your high risk uh, AI projects are. And there will be times that you're spending months and sometimes years in R&D. Uh, but there are AI projects that you can execute within you know days and weeks. So it's understanding the time investment and how much time uh, will be spent in exploration. Um, talent, I think we've uh, you know certainly uh, broadly accepted that there is uh, you know, consistently a talent shortage in data, in analytics. Um, I will say I've seen it less so on the data science side um, and more so on the data engineering side. And, and the difference really being that um, my data, the data scientists who can develop these models, I'm seeing less of a shortage, but the folks who can put it into production um, and um, ensure that we're making these predictions at scale, who are running that data infrastructure, that's where we're starting to see um, um, a challenge in the talent pool. Also moving things to production. How do you know when your model is good enough to, uh, to push out there? Um, you know, we have, uh, we've uh, applied a layer of what we call applied, uh, the applied data scientist who works with our R&D teams. Um, and guess what? I don't need that model to be 99% accurate. 90% um, accurate already gives my customer enough lift. So let's pull it out of R&D and move it into production while you continue to work on, on the problem. And of course, there's always, depending on you know, what you're predicting, there's a whole ethics and explainability component. AI can be you know, a bit of a black box and people don't understand what happens in there. And so uh, having the ability to explain what's happening can be crucial in certain cases. 
Uh, and then it's also the ethics. You have to have a nice ethics process wrapped around everything so that um, you know uh, you can make sure that you're abiding by the ethical principles of your organization um, and, uh, and you tie in that with uh, the whole data privacy angle as well. So uh, this all makes AI projects a heck of a lot more challenging, I will say, than a traditional you know, software development uh, project. Now added onto that, you have to have a way to get this out into software, um, which uh, you wrap SDLC around as well. Um, so there's, as I mentioned on the governance side, there's data, AI, and governance challenges. And uh, the way that we kind of like to look at that is, um, and, and these two kind of things have really helped us, um, and we're seeing it start at a number of different organizations. People are at different maturity levels, but uh, having uh, data ops and ML ops, right? Um, we have this notion of DevOps, uh, which we've had for years, which is our single path to production for software, you know, at Geotab. Uh, data ops is the single path to production for data. You have to treat data like a product, right? Um, and if you're going to push any data to production, it should go through a data ops function so that they're the ones who are monitoring and managing uh, the data. Same with your machine learning models. There needs to be a single path to production. Um, ironically, I will say in most organizations that I've spoken, these, are very, they, these aren't at the maturity level that they need to be at and are, are oftentimes just missing uh, completely. And, and without these, it becomes very, very difficult to scale uh, anything um, because guess what? You put your model out there, who's managing it? How do you uh, ensure that it's doing what it needs to do? You have personnel leave. You need a function within the organization that can scale this, and that's through data ops and ML ops. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, and Andrew Ng um, has, uh, I, I saw this post that he posted a few months ago, um, and I couldn't agree more. Oftentimes we have data scientists who are very much focused on how do I get the, the perfect model? But guess what? If you spent a little bit more time on making sure you had good quality data, the impact of your predictions are better than any model that you could, uh, that you could create, right? So the, the whole push is focus on making your data better quality so that uh, you can have these, these better predictions. Um, one of the challenges that, you know, another challenge that, you know, uh, we face as an industry, I think, in general is, is data labeling challenges, right? Especially if you're looking at, you know, supervised learning problems, which are a significant number of problems. Um, and by 2023, this is ex estimated just the data labeling business is expected to be a $5 billion business. And again, to back it up, um, what I mean by data labeling is uh, in supervised models, you need to understand when um, uh, what the truth is. So give you an example, uh, at Geotab, we've got excellent data on um, the engine diagnostics. So I can look at these cranking voltage curves. I can look at my ambient air temperature, all these amazing things, but I don't necessarily know with 100% certainty when a battery actually failed. Um, to, and I need to know that to drive my supervised learning model. And uh, so, there are a number of different techniques that you can do to get that. We work hand in hand with a lot of partners who will uh, provide us this label data. But this is, a, you know, a problem that we face. And, and one of the things that we've done is we've um, developed a faceting program with kind of a human in the loop. So the human in the loop is a data scientist who knows what to look for um, to label these things in the data at scale. And we're able to do that leveraging a tool called Facet. So this is uh, kind of a, a bit of a, a, a trick that we use um, at, at Geotab. There's also uh, the gamification of uh, data labeling, um, where uh, you know there are organizations who will make money just identifying objects. You need to be a little careful of ethical practices there, because oftentimes this is sent halfway across the world, and God knows if people are paying um, uh, equitably uh, at that point in time. So there's a huge industry just in the gamification of labeling data. And this other one is really interesting. And you've seen, you see it come to play mainly in vision-based systems, right? Anything to do with video. So to be able to um, train, um, you know, uh, anything that you're doing from a video analytics perspective, um, simulation is a very interesting way to do that because you can simulate the events that you want to have happen um, and, uh, and use those as, as labels. So you can provide the, uh, um, the simulator, all the labels that you're uh, looking to gather. So that's an interesting way to do it. And there's a couple of really interesting companies 
in that space. But data labeling is certainly you know, a challenge that pervades out there. Data residency issues. Um, so, uh, and data residency can be quite the challenge because not only uh, do you have data residency that differs on a country by country level, but it varies sometimes at the subnational level. We see, you know, California has its own uh, Consumer Privacy Act, uh, which has gone through a few different iterations. We have different provincial legislation. And if we don't get these things right at the subnational level, at the very least, it ends up causing so many problems to scale because you can imagine that you certainly companies like Geotab, like Amazon, like Google have, uh, you know, departments that are very, very concerned about data residency issues. But if I'm a small startup, these can be tricky things to navigate. So we have to be careful of, of you know, the data residency legislation that we put in place because it can prevent innovation as well, too. Um, and because when you do this kind of thing, guess what? your data lands in a specific jurisdiction, you can't touch that data in another jurisdiction. So you have to duplicate effectively a lot of your infrastructure um, in these different jurisdictions. And if you're a large multinational, this is something you just, you can't, uh, can't ignore. So data residency is certainly um, um, uh, an interesting issue. Data privacy is, uh, is very similar, right? Um, so uh, from a data privacy perspective, um, um, you know, looking at what data is actually private and considered private can be simple in certain industries, right? If you're looking at, you know, uh, bank transaction statements, I can look at, you know, uh, the account numbers, you know, the, um, uh, the, the person's name, date of birth. These are all very easily, easy to understand why they would be identifiable. However, if you look at something like location data, it can be very tricky. Is, uh, the fact that you know Mike went from his uh, home to his office, that is an identifiable trip. The fact that I had a harsh breaking incident at the corner of you know Bronte and Lakeshore, is that is that really identifiable? Probably not. So just having underst an understanding of the context behind geospatial data can be quite tricky. And I will say that nobody's really got their head wrapped completely around this. Um, and it makes it very difficult when you have differing privacy legislation, again, at the, at the subnational level uh, as well. And we always push for looking ahead. What do we think privacy is going to look like? What is the right thing to do? And if you put that hat on, I find that tends to help. And, and it helps you have this, uh, this balance between privacy and innovation because the two can coincide and you can implement these solutions with privacy by design practices. But it takes, uh, takes a bit of work. So how do we tackle a few of these things? So I'll talk to you about the people, the process and the technology that we use at Geotab. Um, I've talked about some of the challenges uh, that exist out there. I've talked about, you know, kind of where the state of AI is, what we're doing at, at Geotab. So at Geotab, um, scaling AI, you need to be able to scale the, the way that you manage your teams as well too. And we, truly believe in a, a kind of a squad based uh, approach. But before I even talk about kind of that squad based approach was, was popularized by Spotify and this kind of thing. Um, I thought I'd show you what the makeup of our team looks like to give you a sense of where we're putting our uh, emphasis on from a resourcing perspective. Um, so first of all, the, you know, the split between male and female isn't exactly where I'd like it to be. We're at 72% male, 28% female. I'd like it to be higher. It's just, it's a tricky thing to do, I will say, in the, uh, in, in the world of tech, but um, we're doing as much as we can to kind of make sure that we get that, that level higher because we find so much diversity in thought comes and we have diversity in backgrounds too. So within data scientists, it's interesting because you can have somebody come from an engineering background, a psychology background, and they can make equally good data scientists. So I think that's where it's interesting as opposed to some of the other technical fields. But if you look at it broadly, and these aren't the exact kind of categories, but we've got data scientists, data engineers, software engineers, product and program managers, and, and, then, and then management. And you can see the different teams we have. So we have a data product discovery team, which is concerned about new innovation, finding these new data products. And they're kind of tuned to fast fail, iterate quickly on, on problems. Uh, we've got a data and machine learning ops function, which I explained is all about making sure you have a single path to production for all of your data, uh, making sure the same is, holds true for your um, uh, machine learning models. The, our data platform team, that's where you have really at that point, I'm no data science, but you're all focused on uh, the data engineers. 
uh, the amount of data that's coming in, the volume from an ingestion perspective, this is what they're doing. The data infrastructure team looks at our infrastructure and the technologies that we're using. We use a lot of Google products, Google BigQuery is a, a big component of what we do. The data solutions team is a team that's actually devising the solutions. So a lot of software engineers combined with data scientists doing a lot of research and development work and pushing this out to production. Uh, we've got an agile services and education team that focuses on making sure that you know, our teams are working as effectively as possible together and then uh, data privacy. So that kind of rounds out the function. There's a lot of intricacy to that, um, but you know, these are really important functions to have when you're looking at scaling. And how we operate, we operate as a bit of a DNA center of excellence. So our data analytics team uh, has at its core, a whole series of, uh, of professionals, uh, which you saw on the previous page there, but that doesn't include all of the data analysts in all the other departments. And uh, so everything from the embedded team to support solutions engineering, it's, it's crucial for them to have data analysts and data scientists sitting on their team, understanding you know, uh, the unique problems that these other teams face whilst having a nice connection into the center of excellence team. We do you know, weekly uh, all hands meetings. Uh, we uh, have a number of different chat forums that are very uh, geared towards specific topics. We introduced something recently called the Google BigQuery Police, which uh, if you know anything about Google BigQuery, um, uh, you essentially pay for the resources that you use. So if you don't write a good query in Google BigQuery, you end up spending a heck of a lot more. So, and it also helps from a training perspective. So what we're doing is we've initiated a team of people who monitors all the different queries that are happening within the ecosystem and providing guidance to people who may have written something a little bit more inefficiently to help them get better, but also to help us control our costs uh, as well. So uh, scaling this with the center of excellence approach has worked out quite well. We do a number of uh, data boot camps uh, as well. This is for our, uh, our ecosystem of partners to help them grow because it's one thing for us to grow as a team, but we need to ensure that our ecosystem is growing and, and being um, uh, and, and using data to the forefront of, of what it can. So the, these three day sessions uh, that we really go into depth on everything from how to build out a predictive maintenance model um, uh, through to intelligent transportation systems use cases. So some really interesting things there. Um, and, and a bit about the process. I talked about some of the teams and, and the people that we have and, and how that's structured, but what about the process? How do you scale? Um, and we, we've, we've experimented with this a lot in the past and some things have worked and some things haven't. You know, We're on a constant learning trajectory here as well too, but one of the things that we have found that has worked is really focusing on these product-centric teams, right? And in that core team, isn't four people, but there are four kind of core functions, uh, is the product manager um, uh, who is focused on the vision for the product and working with the user experience team. Uh, the technical project manager who's focused on the day-to-day -day and is writing all the epics in JIRA and is really coordinating the team's efforts. Uh, our, our software developers of which there will be a lead and an applied data scientist. And here's the thing with that applied data scientist, they now are that conduit to the research and development teams who are doing the heavy lifting on predictive maintenance and all these kinds of things. And when that research is ready to be applied to the software product, the applied data scientist reaches out and starts pulling it into the, uh, the core team. And then there's some shared services that go on top of this as well. So for that core team, they're going to need um, a, a data ops professional, an ML ops professional, a scrum master, and then a UX or, or product designer. The product designer works very closely, I would say most closely with the dev team and the product manager to get things right. And these typically come from other areas of the business with differing levels of, of dedication. So this process of creating this really squad based approach whereby um, it, it is a true matrix style team that we, have, we found has, has worked quite well to accelerate um, uh, scaling these AI projects. Um, and what we've also done from a process pr perspective is train people to really think again about data as a product. And that goes into making sure that you've got a proper data catalog with discoverability and lineage, uh, that you've got some excellent data quality um, uh, checks and you've built in anomaly detection to make sure that you're looking for data quality issues. Um, data residency I've talked about already, I know data ingestion and pipelines um, and monitoring these pipelines, uh, data privacy, data ops, and, and the stewardship around this data. So 
when we think about data, it's not just a byproduct of some other system. It truly is a product in and of itself that has to be managed as such. Because if you don't manage it like a product, um, you're not going to get um, uh, reap the rewards of, uh, of AI and what it can do for you. Um, from a process perspective, we've enabled uh, rapid experimentation uh, as well. We have launched last year our new analytics lab in the GeoTab ecosystem, which allows that our data product discovery team to rapidly iterate uh, and showcase new um, uh, experimental solutions uh, before they get launched in full in the uh, in the core product. And this has been really instrumental because uh, with AI, you want to test certain things that uh, we have a better collision detection model, or I can more intelligently geofence and zone um, uh, areas based on your vehicle movement. Let me show you how we can do that. So these these experiments um, help uh, guide the product and uh, in a way that is is quite good from a process perspective. Helps um, us rapidly iterate. And then finally, the tech. So we built our technology to scale. It has to scale. Everything that we do, um, you know, we have to be constantly thinking about supporting millions and millions of vehicles. Um, at this point in time, we're at about, uh, this was a couple months ago, uh, you know, 11 petabytes of storage, uh, 30,000 telematics records coming in per second. Um, and with that, we've managed to uh, maintain about a five to 10 second delay from the time the data hits our gateway servers in the cloud to the time it's available to our data scientists to, to work on it. Um, so we use Google Cloud Platform for everything uh, that we do. Um, the data comes in over the cellular network, hits our compute engine, uh, um, sorry, our, our gateway servers, which is hosted on the compute engine uh, in the cloud, um, goes into our big data ingestion platform, or BIP for short. We're not marketers, we're, we're you know, data engineers here, so we call it BIP. Um, and uh, for that, we leverage Kafka, uh, as a means to control the pace at which data is then sent through to uh, BigQuery. Um, and we've got the ability to do it from a streaming perspective, but also batch. Um, data, all the data gets housed in Google BigQuery, uh, which has been, I will say, one of the single biggest um, assets to the organization. Um, it's been fantastic to work with. We have a number of, uh, for the processes that don't aren't required to be you know, immediate, we have a number of ETL processes and scheduled jobs written in Airflow that kind of take data from BigQuery and shift it around and push it back into BigQuery. And we've also got a, a data as a service digestion. So we've got the ingestion portion at the top and the data digestion portion uh, at, the, at the bottom there. And we leverage Kubernetes for a lot of this as well too. Uh, which allows us to both stream data from um, the BIT platform directly to an API endpoint, or we can take it from Google BigQuery and, and, and pump it in that way as well too. This is a very, very simplistic diagram of, of what we're doing on the data side. Um, but uh, some of the technologies that we're using, we also use MLflow to coordinate the uh, our model development and the technologies that our staff use in general. Again, we like to pick technology that is uh, very much open source wherever possible, but managed in this case by one of the cloud vendors like Google. Um, BigQuery is an exception to that, um, but Dataflow, you know, is off of Apache Beam. We have got Kafka, Kubernetes, uh, Airflow. We use Cloud Composer, um, MLflow, and Kubeflow. And then our so those are what our data engineers use. And there's a mix between our, what our data engineers use and what our data scientists will use. Um, and of course, they're using everything from a machine learning perspective, simple tools like Scikit-Learn all the way through to TensorFlow and PyTorch, depending on what we need to do. Jupyter Labs is the environment that they work in. And for some lighter touch analysis, we'll even use Colab because you can just spin it up in a browser pretty quickly. So these are that formulates some of the core technologies that we use in the data and analytics department. Um, and happy to discuss more if anybody has questions. Uh, but I thought what I do is I've got like, I think two minutes left here and I'm just gonna end it here and, and just, Again, I want to convey that the foundation of good AI and being able to scale this is good data. You don't have good data, you don't have good AI, and that significantly limits our ability to innovate, create these next-gen products. And that's what we're trying to do here um, at Geotap. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them now. You can feel free to reach out to me. Here's my LinkedIn profile. Um, and then if you're interested in careers at all, I'm not sure who all is in the audience, but have a look at our, our careers that we're always hiring, um, specifically my team. I think we've grown by about 30 or 40 just during COVID. Um, 
And Chad, I guess I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, we already have some questions coming in, it looks like. Uh, so we have one that's um, asking regarding uh, table labeling. Um, could you please elaborate a bit on this topic? How do you store slash find your labels? Any suggestion for collecting slash storing labels for different kinds of data? Example, images, sensors, data slash time series. Any specific data sets used to store slash relate labels and data? Yeah, so uh, like I said, data labeling is uh, is definitely a challenge. So the, 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 the two things that have been most helpful to us from a data labeling perspective is uh, on our predictive maintenance side, we work with some of our large customers and they will have those maintenance records, right? So they will know in the case that I said, you know, when um, a uh, battery failed and it was taken to the shop and they'll have the work order number. So wherever you can, um, trying to pair with it, whether it be a customer or a partner to be able to access that kind of data is, is actually quite valuable. Um, barring that, uh, again, we use, so the faceting tool that we use allows us to do it quite, uh, so we have a vehicle vocation model that we've developed, which looks at the usage patterns of a vehicle, right? So it might be, this is a long haul vehicle. This is a hub and spoke delivery vehicle. So we use the data that has been generated to create these features that tell us, um, you know, what kind of movement pattern is being done. Now, a data scientist is actually quite easily able to look at a data pattern and say, yes, that is, you know, a hub and spoke delivery model based on what I know about the data, what I know about the vehicle. So, um, you know, believe it or not, for a full summer, we had some junior data scientists going in there and, and labeling that kind of data. And we push everything to Google BigQuery where is where our labels are stored. So data labeling can be a challenge, but it, you really have to look at what your um, uh, what the problems you're trying to address and, and, and think about some creative ways to go about it. Uh, let's see, we got, I got another question here. Thanks to the presentation. How do you address data privacy concerns to your partners as Geotab? Yes, yeah. So um, with regards to data privacy, we are very, very clear uh, that the data coming in uh, is our customer's data. Absolutely, with 100% certainty that is. Now, when we look at uh, creating um, insight for our customers, new models and this kind of thing. Um, uh, we, we have layers that we go through that there's a, a huge amount of de-identification. There's a huge amount of, of work that goes into ensuring only the right people at Geotab have, have access to that data. And we are never taking that, that individual, individual level customer data and shipping it out of, of Geotab. That never happens. Um, there's, uh, we do a number of motivated intruder attacks from third party consultants, any data and insights that we're looking to pushing outside, like you'll see our, our free data portal, Geotab Ignition, which anybody can log into, shows different things like dangerous driving areas in cities and, and this kind of thing. And in order to even expose that data, we're looking at, um, you know, a minimum of, you know, a set of customers has to have experienced a dangerous driving incident at that intersection in a specific period of time. Um, and, uh, and no waiting by any one individual customer. Uh, the interesting thing here is you put your ethical hat on. It's a good thing for us to release this kind of data because it helps city planners um, better understand where there's dangerous intersections within their cities while still being privacy compliant. Important to do those motivated intruder attacks though. Uh, we employ both that internally and then we have external consultants that work with us there. And uh, we're uh, in the next few weeks, you'll actually see a combined white paper from uh, ourselves and, and Deloitte going out there talking about data privacy and how to do it right with, uh, with telematics. Um, and do you have any suggestions to improve data quality? Um, <clears throat> so anomaly, to, like start with the basics, I will say. Um, there are some basic things that you can monitor from, um, uh, from an anomaly detection perspective, things like just even looking at, uh, you, you know, the number of records coming in, uh, the, uh, the standard deviation on specific values. So I would start pretty basic. Um, but what that doesn't sometimes tell you is, was that data point itself correct in the first place? Um, for us, that's important because we work very closely with our embedded team to um, and we have a nice relationship set up there. So as much as you can put in place a lot of anomaly detection, 
Um, sometimes the quality, uh, under uncovering these data quality issues comes from the data, the work that your data scientists are doing and having an effective mechanism to feed that back into the source. In our case, it would be the device and the embedded folks who are working with the device. That is, that is crucial. One of our attendees have a question directly they want to ask. Yeah, go for it. I'm just going to open their Hi, mic. How are you? Good, good. Nice presentation. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about different legis legislation in different countries because it makes like some different algorithms depending on the the global market that you're working on. Uh, is it how complex is that? Because I believe that you have to do different algorithms algorithms for different countries, but for the same solution. So <laughs> yes, it's like you have a unique solution. Will have to work like do some customizations in each country. How complex is that? That is a very loaded and tricky question. I think uh, Thales, if I got your your name right. Um, yes, yes, Thales. It, uh, it, it, it. I think there's no one right answer. The so our approach to that is we we look at data privacy from the landscape of where we're currently operating. Right. So we'll look at a, a we'll look at a view of okay, we're operating in the U.S., in Canada, um, you know, in Europe, and in, in these there's you know six or seven core jurisdictions that we operate in, and we look at the legislation in those uh, in those areas, and we try to take a view of what is the intent behind that those regulations. We keep tabs on you know what's happening in each of these jurisdictions, and then thinking ahead. Where do we think this is going and where is the most restrictive legislation and how do we design for that? Because if we had to design an individual solution for every single jurisdiction, that is simply not scalable or feasible. Um, so when we look at this, you know, GDPR and CCPA tend to be two of the more restrictive. CCPA, I would argue, is more restrictive than, than GDPR in many cases. So we look at that and look at a lens of what they're trying to accomplish. We put our ethical hats on, try to predict what the future is going to look like and devise a solution uh, around uh, that. That being said, from a, a residency perspective, no matter what solution you put in place, ideally it's the same solution across the board. You have to split your pipelines per jurisdiction because you're collecting raw level data in each of those jurisdictions and you can't centralize that anywhere, right? So um, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thanks cool. a lot. Cool. Well, uh, if anybody has any other questions, you can you know, certainly feel free to, to reach out to me uh, via LinkedIn or, or whatever. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here today, Chad. Thank you, Mike. I actually have one last question I'll ask yeah. you if I give time. Absolutely. Um, so right now we currently have some examples of narrow AI with uh, IBM Watson supercomputer, expert systems, and self-driving vehicles. Um, in regards of artificial general intelligence, how close do you think that we're reaching to that point? Do you have any opinion I, on that matter? Um, I think we're still like a, a, a ways out from uh, from that. I mean, I think there are a lot of there, look. There are a lot of interesting things that have happened over the last uh, few years. Um, and, um, and, and, but, but you look at what is very difficult oftentimes, if you even look at, um, autonomous driving as an example, um, oftentimes getting 99% of the way there is the easiest part. It's the, that last 1% that is very, very tricky. Um, and with autonomous driving, you know, that these conditions that, um, are very tricky to replicate. And the things that you're seeing these autonomous vehicles do in situations that, you know, a human driver would never do, um, uh, you know, it's that last 1% that's tricky. So I'm gonna wager, you know, you know, not for, you know, decades uh, certainly to, uh, to come. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, and uh, yes, this uh, presentation will be recorded for anybody that uh, would like to view it later or that hasn't been able to view it or weren't able to attend, and uh, we'll be offering Mike's uh, information for anybody that would like to reach out to Mike to uh, possibly network or ask him any follow-up questions regarding the presentation. Great. Have a good rest of the day, folks. Cheers. Thank you so much.